I think we're going to begin the next session, so settle down and All right. Well, thanks so much for being here. Um, this is a very uh, exciting event for me personally. Um, I, looking back at the 25-year history of Bioneers, all these um, people, individuals you see sitting here have had a very important role in the evolution of this community. Um, and I'm going to not spend a long time introducing Paul and Jeffrey, because I believe, uh, how many of you he were here this morning? All of you, right? So, okay, so we're not going to rehash. <laughs> um, but um, I just want to quickly say that um, the one person who hasn't been introduced on this main stage is someone who has graced this main stage many times in the past is Goodgy Cook, who um, is a pioneer in reintroducing um, Aboriginal midwifery practices and also a heroic environmental researcher up in her part of the world in northern New York State in Ontario um, in the Iroquois lands. and. Um, yeah, I remember a, a slogan I heard long ago from uh, Iroquois people that if you want to get something done, ask a Mohawk. And so we have a Mohawk here who's gotten a whole lot done in her lifetime. Um, and Guji participated a lot in the early years of Bioneers and in the middle years um, on panels on herbalism and, med and you know, green medicine. Um, and she's also one of the most beautiful singers that I've ever heard, but I don't know if that's going to be part of the program today. But in any case, uh, <laughs> um, I've never forgotten her her singing. Um, anyway, um, and to her immediate right, I guess, um, is Paul Stamets, who you all know, the, uh, um, how can I say this, the superstar of biomimicry and mycology, one of the people that we love the most deeply and uh, a real fun guy. So, uh, you know, um, ay, 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 you know. It's that Jewish New York thing, you have to throw, throw the bad joke in there, you know, so stuff. Um, and then you all heard from Jeffrey Brompton this morning, and he's someone who's really integral in the early, um, earliest launch of Bioneers and who's really been a deep, deep ally from the very, very beginning. And so this is a real historical reunion for us. Um, and of course, we're going to be exploring the use of sacred plants, um, which is something that can be controversial, but in this community, I think, is not probably really a controversial topic, but nonetheless, a really fascinating one. Um, so. I think that what we are especially interested in focusing on today is not only you know, the effects of these plants, what they are, but um, we're going to especially focus on how the, the wisdom and the, um, the visionary states and the other things that, occur, um, that come through the teachings of these plant teachers, um, how they can be translated into action in the world. But before we do that, I do want to begin by asking each of our presenters here, how they first encountered the sacred plant, what their experiences were, and just briefly so we know where they're coming from before we get into that second theme. And I know, for, we'll start with you, Gudji, that for you, it's not native to your, the use of these powerful, you know, psych, you know, however you want to call them, but mind, mind altering plants are not part of your culture, but that it came through pan tribal rela family relationships through your relationships with Mayan people and with people in the, in the southwest of the, well, in Lakota and other relatives of yours. I'll let you start with perhaps your ex first encounter and experience with sacred plants. Thank you, JP, and thank you, Jeffrey and Paul. Um, my name is Dragi Jakwa. I'm a Mohawk from Akwesasne Mohawk Nation on the U.S. Canadian border, Quebec, Ontario, and New York State. Uh, in my uh, journey to becoming a traditional Mohawk midwife, um, I left uh, a training program at the University of New Mexico, uh, having left my community asking my clan mothers, how do we teach the young about birth? And they said, oh, uh, we forgot all that. So I set out on a journey across the U.S. and ended up with my mother-in-law, Beatrice Holy Dance Long Visitor, one of the 13 indigenous grandmothers who delivered many babies in her community. And I asked, uh, you know, how is this done? And she said, daughter-in-law, if you want to know that, you have to go in that teepee. And I said, um, 
our longhouse people teach not to use any mind changers. And she said, daughter-in-law, I don't think you know what this medicine is. It's a spirit. And some have seen him. He has long white hair down to his knees. And you make a relationship with him. And so I sat in there with my sister-in-law and uh, through the night and realized by midnight water that I was in labor. I was in a birth, that I was on a journey to learn midwifery, to handle the lives of two human beings, and this medicine became my teacher. And in fact, the fireplace of the TP Society uh, where I live is our university. That's where we know what we know uh, about the process of, of becoming and giving birth and how our ancestors play a role in all of that. Uh, and in the interest of time, I would say that in fact, the word hallucinogen is one of those uh, science words that really is not in our consciousness as Mohawk people. And in fact, the sacred medicine, Onukwakgoa, uh, Pejutawakan, Peyote, uh, belongs to a family of medicine, that the focus of the ceremony is not even the peyote, it's the tobacco that came to this world in the hands of a pregnant woman who fell from a hole in the sky world and brought from a sacred tree gifts of seeds and sacred things. And among those things were uh, the oyunkwa'unwe, the old ancient one, our Indian tobacco, which is also classified as a hallucinogen. Uh, when you burn that tobacco in the sacred fire with your thoughts, your words, your intentions, that smoke, they call it, it, that goes back to that hole in the sky world to carry your words to the sky being, sky beings, um, the la diluja que lo nolo. The words for that process is called gayangalit, and it means it hits and it opens. And so that's what the sacramental use of our oyunkwa'unwe, our Indian tobacco, is really about. It's not about this. And the other uh, hallucinogen is um, our onunkwa, uh, onanono, which is the small sweet flag that grows all over the world in marshy areas. And since I was a little girl, my grandmother, when we were sick in the fall, maybe a chest, anything in the head and the chest, onunkwa, uh, uh, onun, calamus ecorus. And I didn't know that until uh, a colleague of mine um, who was the dean of a school of public health was quarantined for animal or human forms of um, uh, TB, and he called me from his home describing his illness, and so I sent in the mail to him uh, some ononoru uh, and instructed him how to use it, that you break off a knuckle of it, stick it in your cheek, and you make a relation with it, ask it to help you, and uh, hold it in there, and it'll, it'll swell with all those poisons that are making you ill. And he did that for a week, and he called me and said, what is that stuff you gave me? He said, not only did I stop coughing up blood, but my mood improved, and I was curious about that. So I looked at James Duke's database at the, at the uh, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, and sure enough, he had characterized the molecular contents of this medicine and it said beta acerone is responsible for the mildly hallucinogenic uh, quality of this plant. Uh, a plant that my grandmother would send me and my sister when we went away to a Catholic boarding school off the reservation. And so um, I had no idea. So JP, we do have hallucinogenic plants, but this plant uh, is, we call it Ononoro Goa, the big medicine for anything to, to help you. And so with that, um, I'll pass it. 
Well, um, I grew up in a small town in Ohio near Youngstown called Columbiana. It was a dry town, very conservative. I was dragged to charismatic Christian revival tents a lot when I was around 14 or 15. And many, some of you heard about my, my brother John passing, and he was my mentor. And John went to Yale, and he was, um, and when he came back from Yale, uh, he brought back a book uh, when I was 15 years of age, and it was called Altered States of Consciousness uh, by Charles Tart in 1970. And uh, my best friend, Ryan Snyder, oh, I grew up with him and we hung out together all the time. And uh, I was just mesmerized by my brother John's experiences in Mexico and Colombia, eating magic mushrooms. And I was a younger brother, all too eager to, to emulate my older brother. Um, and he lent me this book. Um, and so I had this book, Older States of Consciousness, and I'm sharing it with my friend, Ryan Snyder. And Ryan goes, well, I want to borrow, borrow this book. And I said, sure, Ryan, you know, but give it back to me in a week, you know, so that was okay. So a week passes and I go, Ryan, you know, it's been a week, give me back my book. And he kind of hemmed and hawed and wouldn't return the book. And so I waited a little while longer and a while longer and I kept on asking him, he kept on avoiding the question. And finally I said, I demand, I want that book back. I'll come down to your house and get it. And he goes, I'm sorry, Paul, I can't give it back to you. And I said, why? He said, my father found it and burned it. I said, your father burned my book? <laughs> it was given to me by my brother in trust. You know, I'm in the middle of this. And uh, so, and it really upset me. But then I began to think, wow, the information in that book was so powerful. It made, it inspired, it made somebody burn the book because they had the fear of this knowledge. So I thought, wow, this is the forbidden fruit. And, I'm <laughs> and these charismatic Christians are just really not in the same realm that I want to be in, right? So my brother John, that realm was much more interesting to me. So this really influenced me in a huge way. I never got the book back, by the way. Um, and, um, and Ryan Snyder's father was convinced, you know, I was from Satan and corrupting his son. Anyhow, so I didn't have a magic mushroom experience until I went to Kenyon College in Ohio when I was around 19 years of age. And I was really eager to get some magic mushrooms. So I, I bought some and I got a bag of mushrooms for like 20 bucks. And I thought, okay, it's reasonable. Um, but nobody else would, you know, I didn't know who else to eat them with. So um, late in the spring, early summer, I decided that, well, set and setting's important. I read about that. You know, Andrew Weil had a chapter in the book and a whole bunch of other people. And so I just thought, well, I'll walk about two miles to this really, really beautiful rolling uh, Green Hill countryside with these beautiful oak trees. Um, and so I thought, okay, I might as well eat the mushrooms. And I thought the bag was like one dose, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, I figured, well, okay, you know, they said about half an hour before it came, came come on. So about halfway through the walk, I started eating the mushrooms. And then I'm eating the mushrooms, and, I, and I'm in love with climbing trees ever since I was a kid, you know. And there's this huge oak tree um, on the very, the very top of this hill. So I'm eating the mushrooms, I see this oak tree, you know, it's just perfect for climbing. And, I, and a storm was coming. I could hear thunder and lightning in the, on the horizon. So this is the tree is the very top of the high, highest hill. And I thought it would be a great viewscape. So I consumed the entire bag of mushrooms. And I climbed to the top of the tree so I have a really good, good visual. And then this visual was, you know, those of you in the Midwest in the summer, you know, with these, these boiling black clouds with lightning strikes, you know. And then I started having, you know, suddenly the, the air became a liquid. Whoa, this is what I read about, you know, look at this, you know. And then the storm front's coming out at me. And then fractal patterns. Waves. Well, whoa, this is really interesting, you know. But the experience didn't slow down. It kept on getting more and more intense. And I'm at the top of this tree and I started getting vertigo and the storm and the lightning is coming and this real, this frontal uh, hot wind I mean, precedes the clouds, you know, before the rain comes. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm getting vertigo. I am in the most dangerous place that you can be <laughs> doing a lightning storm at the top of this hill. Uh, and so I, held on to the tree for sustenance, you know, because it anchored me. And then holding on to the tree, I went through the tree into the roots and being, had 
this feeling that you spoke so eloquently of oneness with the planet. And what you have not mentioned is I had a congenital stuttering habit. I went through six years of speech therapy. I stuttered all my life like this. And I couldn't speak. Um, now, the stutterers like my, myself, we can speak without stuttering to animals. And we can sing. But we come to people, we can't speak without stuttering. So I went through six years of speech therapy in the third and fourth grade. They pulled a meeting with the school officials to put me in special education. It was that severe. My family was very, very concerned. But I scored really high on all my tests. So they realized that my speech impediment was not because I wasn't smart, it's just the societal thing. So I'm up in this tree and the winds and the waves and the lightning and I'm just like closing my eyes and I open up and you know, the, the intensity was so much, but I thought this is where I'm going to die. This is a good place to die. Um, I'm, I'm rooted literally to the earth. And then I'm up there for hours and I thought my biggest issue is I can't speak. I have the hardest time. And so I couldn't date ladies because they wanted to be with the macho, self-assured, you know, male personalities. And I was a person who didn't have those attributes. So I wouldn't stare at people in the eyes. I'd always avert my gaze and look on the ground. That's why I found mushrooms. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm tripping my brains out on my first trip and saying that nothing that I read even comes close to this. <laughs> and then I said to myself, what is my big issue, issue in life? And I said, stuttering. And so I said to myself, stop stuttering now. Stop stuttering now. That was my mantra. And I said it hundreds, maybe thousands of times at that edge and the precipitous of being electrocuted from electric, uh, a lightning strike from overdosing from mushrooms, from, but the tree was so important to me. It literally rooted me to the earth. And these, it, the storm passed. Fortunately, I did not get hit by lightning. I came down uh, off the tree and, and literally came down as I walked back. And I went to my room and I went to bed. And then I woke up the next morning and I didn't see anybody. Um, and there's this one lady that, that really liked me. She, I think she was maybe sympathy love or generosity. I'm not sure what, what it was, but I came out of my room and I'm walking down the sidewalk and then here she comes. I go, oh no. And I always like, you know, hi and look down on the ground, you know, and didn't want to say anything else but one syllable because I could usually get that out. Um, and she came up to me and she said, good morning, Paul. And for the first time I looked at her straight in the eyes and she asked me, how are you doing today? And I said, I'm doing great. And I stopped stuttering in one day. Now, as a short caveat, I still do stutter. Like when I met Bill Gates and Al Gore, I'm starstruck, you know, so I will stutter. Um, if someone throws a microphone in front of me and I've been drinking, you know, smoking some herb, you know, and they ask me, how do you grow mushrooms? I'm going, <laughs> like filling a well with a teaspoon. Where do I start? You know, uh, it's, uh, so there are times that I, I do get when I get nervous and whatnot, but you know, I would say it's 99% cured from one psilocybin experience. And I think I basically, from a physiological, neurological point of view, I was able to uh, reestablish a different neural network. And, and I've been told by some, uh, audit, uh, some scientists who study this that in this, with some type of stutterers in the sixth to seventh month in the womb, um, when my mother was pregnant, uh, uh, there were, a nerve did not develop properly. And so us uh, stutterers, what half, oftentimes happens is that we'll try to change a word up really fast and we'll try to trick our brain. So if you see a stutterer and they pause, they're actually trying to get away from the word that's hanging them up, you know, and they try to find an alternative word to go around it. Or they're trying to change the subject in their mind because stutterers tend to be really high intelligence and they oftentimes their thought stream is several sentences uh, uh, further ahead than their mouth is speaking. Um, so that, that's really told me that mushrooms 
were my, were my sacrament. They, they were the crack in my cosmic egg that really made a huge difference to me. And I just want to add one little short uh, event. So um, my wife, Dusty, knows the story and she loves it. Um, and so we went to Crater Lake Lodge in Oregon and we're at the lodge and we're having lunch. And this bus boy comes up and he's about 16 years of age or 17. And he goes, don't interrupt a stutterer, just smile, be at peace with it. And he finally goes, can I help you? I went, wow, that's exactly the way I stuttered. And so I told him, I stuttered exactly like you. Now this, this I could tell from the, the cultural imprint of who this young man was, that he came from a very conservative, probably Christian family, just like I did. And I, I said, you know, I used to stutter just like you. And he goes, I'm, this is actually getting real for me. Uh, you did. And I, and I go, yeah. And I was able to cure it in one day. And he goes, well, what did you do? So I told him this whole story. <laughs> His eyes got really wide. <laughs> my wife is like ready to have a heart attack. Like, oh my God. <laughs> and he walked away, but I felt like, yeah, that was right on, you know. <laughs> I just wanted to add one note, which is that from the Bioneers perspective, it should be Al Gore and Bill Gates who would be stuttering and nervous in the presence of Paul Stamets. <laughs> I have a phenomenon that happens with me. I'll be traveling, sitting on a plane, and someone will come up to me and go, what do you do? <laughs> and I remember for years I've been working on different ways of answering that question. And, and, uh, and so trying to find a way to tell this part of my story is, is uh, not necessarily going to be that easy because uh, there's a lot of steps that brought me to the moment where I had my first encounter with the sacramental use you know, of a plant. And uh, I was actually introduced by a, a non-Indian friend uh, to a group of Native American people um, who he had been uh, in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, he had left Taos and moved to Austin, Texas, where I was living at the time, and he was uh, leading sweat lodge ceremonies that he had learned there. And between rounds in the sweat lodge ceremony, he started speaking about some experiences that he had had, just very casually, not in any way to... Um, elicit any kind of response from anybody, but I picked up on it and, and, and he described that it was experiences with, with the sacred medicine peyote within the Native American church. And so I asked him, I said, if there's ever an opportunity to have this experience, I'd like to, I'd like to know more about it. And at that time in my life, I was, I was, it was a new thing to consider reopening the door and what, you know, Gaji referred to as hallucinogens, which I had thought I had had some experience with and I decided that it wasn't for me. But there was levels through years of meditation practice that I had had up until that point. I kind of believed in the prevailing philosophy of that time that I think was articulated well by Ram Dass, which is once you get the message, you know, hang up the phone, you know, and just once you get the message that the spirit world exists, no longer, you know, use any kind of, of uh, psychoactive, you know, aids, go and pursue meditation, a life of discipline, a life of practice, and then you could reach these states of consciousness without, you know, this. And I'd done that faithfully for 20 years, and this guy was talking outside the sweat lodge about something that I had not even come close to experiencing in my meditation practice, and I wanted to. So I had my first experience of, of the use of peyote within a sacramental context in, in, uh, in Texas. There's a, there's a very thin band of uh, close to Laredo, Texas, where the peyote medicine grows. And every year at around President's Day, there's groups of people from the Native American church who come there to, to harvest the peyote and take it back to their communities. And I was invited to come and participate in the ceremony. And anybody who has the idea that the sacred use in a ritual setting of, of um, these very serious plants of power, plants of knowledge, sacred plants, is in any way similar to some kind of recreational use of drug, has not ever entered into a state where you've encountered the reality of, of what these ceremonies are and how they work. And I had the privilege of, of being in a um, ceremony of, uh, that lasted, I think we entered into the teepee at four o'clock in the afternoon. We didn't leave the teepee until nine or 10 o'clock the next morning, maybe 11 o'clock the next morning. And we were there in, in prayer all night long 
as, as, and through the course of the night, there were teachings that started to be given, and I witnessed the elders bringing orientations to this young man who had left the tribe. This was a, tri was a tribe from Oklahoma, which was where the, the medicine was first um, legally incorporated and in its use in the United States in the late 1800s. And he had left the tribe. He was living with kind of a, a community of young people in, outside of Phoenix and was doing a lot of different drugs and things. And, and he was back in front of the sacred fire and back in front of his ancestors and, and his elders. And he was being taught and needing to correct his mistakes. And this was the first time I saw people with experience of wisdom, elders, using the opportunity in a state of transcendent consciousness to orient and, ethics, and, and give orientations about ethics and, and, and how to conduct one's life that are fundamental to the use of, of these sacraments within a, a spiritual context, within a religious context. And so that next morning, this, there was an old man by the name of, of Tell us good morning. That was his name, medicine man from Taos Pueblo. And he was, he's since passed, he was in his 90s at that time, and he comes up to me to shake my hand and wish me good morning, because that's what he did was, you know, say good morning to people. And he, he said to me, he looked at me in the eyes and he said, uh, today you've become a peyote man. And from this day forward, other peyote men are gonna recognize you and know that you're on this medicine path. And what happened to me was, um, Less than two weeks later, I was introduced to a man through a mystic set of circumstances who had been working with the sacred medicine of peyote for um, several decades with elders from different tribes in Mexico, from the Huichol, from the Tarahumara, from the um, uh, Tepoano, different tribes in Mexico that used the sacred medicine. And he was organizing a uh, movement in, this was in 1988, 89, and he was planning for what was going to be the 500th anniversary of Columbus's so-called discovery of America, which was very articulately expressed from the stage today, the beginning of an invasion and the beginning of the imposition of one set of values that held the world and held nature and held our place in nature in a very different uh, cosmology and, and understanding of the world than the... Uh, native people who were here in this hemisphere, who had, who had evolved systems of law, had evolved systems of mathematics, had evolved systems of agriculture, had evolved systems, social systems that had served them for, you know, for, for centuries. And at the time, that wasn't, wasn't recognized. And so we, um, so he invited me to come down to Mexico where I apprenticed for a number of years with different um, peyote medicine people from different tribes. And, and through this uh, teacher was able to go and travel with him to different native tribes throughout um, Central and South America and became introduced to different plant medicines and, and became aware of the fact that all throughout uh, Aboriginal cultures, First Peoples, First Nations cultures, throughout the Americas, there were sacred plants that were psychoactive that, that were part of the original instructions and part of the responsibility of how to, how to live and how to conduct oneself on the earth. And that was when I became aware of, of the use of uh, plants within the Amazon. And I made my first trip down to the Amazon in, in July of 1990 um, at another invitation after attending a, a gathering of indigenous people throughout the hemisphere that were looking to organize uh, a movement in response to this 500th anniversary celebration that was being planned by the Spanish and the Italians, that they were gonna spend billions on what was essentially a celebration of a, of a, con of a conquest and, and the destruction of native cultures. And as a result of a movement that we uh, were able to initiate at that time, we were able to turn that around. And so 1992 became a, a focal point for the re-education of people about the value of the cultures of the Americas that preceded the, the arrival of the, the Europeans. And, uh, and it was a very significant and important social movement. And in the organization that, that happened at that time, I was, uh, I'll, I'll make this brief, but, good, but it's good kind of historical background because the, what, what I hope for this conversation today, um, knowing Gaji and knowing Paul personally, 
um, and as people whose whole life and work has been informed by their connection to these sacred plants, to these sacred medicines. To have a conversation not about their use, but how to utilize the information that comes through these sacred plants in order to bring about benefit to the world. Because I feel that that's the real art of, of working with the sacred science, of how to use the information that comes spiritually to us through the use of these plants and then apply it in a way that brings about changes in the world. So I, um, the next significant moment in the story was I, I met, uh, as I mentioned today, a man by the name of Reuben Snake, uh, who um, fulfilled the prophecy that, that Tell Us Good Morning had said to me. And he got up in a gathering of, of indigenous leaders and that I had been invited as a representative of a, of a foundation that was looking to initiate this social work. Uh, he got up and spoke and I could tell that he was a peyote man from the way that he spoke. There was a certain way that he addressed and certain acknowledgements and certain things that said, oh, this guy, you know, knows peyote. So I came up to him and I said, I, I think I know some relatives of yours. And he looked at me very suspiciously. He said, oh, yeah, who? And I gave him some names and he embraced me then as, as uh, a friend. He said, well, we're having a peyote meeting at, at uh, my house tonight. You guys and your friends are welcome to come. So that was how I met Reuben Snake, which was on April 20th, uh, 1990. And uh, interestingly, that night was the night that the Supreme Court um, decided, published its opinion that the use of peyote wasn't protected under the Constitution of the United States, and the use of sacred plants was not protected under the Bill of Rights. And, uh, um, and that night in the ceremony, we didn't know that this was going to happen. Reuben embraced me as his brother, in front of his family and his tribe, declared that, uh, he was his, that I was his brother and, and um, did a little ritual that night. And, and uh, then, we woke up the next, then we got up the next morning to find out that this had happened with the Supreme Court. And in the first TP meeting that I went to, I encountered a quality of true religious expression that I had not experienced in my life before then. And what I experienced was the years growing up in the temples where we, we were taught in, as uh, you know, the Jewish people shortly after the Holocaust, never again. That was the chant that was there within the temples. Never again to allow a culture and a way of life to be threatened with extermination on this earth. And I took that very much to heart. And that night in that teepee, I saw these very simple, um, humble people whose way of life was threatened. And I made a vow, if there's ever anything that I could do to help this, I make that commitment. And so uh, when I was there with Reuben Snake, and we found out that the Supreme Court had ruled that the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights did not protect the use of sacred plants by native people whose cultures had existed far longer than the Constitution, I said to him, we're going to change this. And he said to me, yes, my brother, we will. And so we started to work on organizing a um, response through connections that Reuben had in Congress um, to bring about a change in the law, a change in the law that opened up uh, was called, uh, was called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And what this act served to do was acknowledge that primary to the ethic of the, of the social experiment that is the United States is, is the guarantee of the free exercise of religion. And to redefine the law about what that meant when the Supreme Court had interpreted it to mean something very restrictive. And I'm only mentioning this as an example because the next 14 years of my life were spent in the process of using the information that would come to me through these sacred plants to first work with the people who could write the law, get the law, law passed, get the law signed into law, get another church that I encountered in Brazil using a different sacred plant registered within the United States, and then a process that led me, as Kenny was describing today, to go through um, the process of arriving to the Supreme Court and getting the Supreme Court to accept the correction of a law that I had played a part in having passed, restoring religious re liberty, restoring religious freedom. So the, the relevant detail that I want to share here is the instructions that allowed me to follow the path, to have the success of making the contribution that I and others were able to make was 100% guided every step of the way by the information that was coming to us through the ceremonies and the instructions that we were following through our practice. So that's, that's how I came to this.
Uh, I just want to mention quickly that um, the the story of that the whole case and all, going through the Supreme Court um, is in a, a book that uh, Bioneers published called Visionary Plant Consciousness that also includes um, a, a great chapter from Goji and several um, participations by Paul because it's a collection based on a lot of talks and um, and plenary addresses that were given here at Bioneers. So if you can get a hold of that book, I recommend it highly. But anyway. Um, I wanted, before we get into um, more about what you were discussing of how the um, messages or the wisdom that comes through these plants um, is expressed in your lives, just a little bit more about what the form that that information comes to you. I mean, I know this is something ineffable and hard to discuss, but, um, and if you're not comfortable discussing it, then we'll go, go somewhere else. But. Um, in what form does it, you know, for some people it may come orally or visually or in a deeper sense of knowing. So just if you could touch upon that of, of how that information is transmitted to you. When you enter through a threshold, you're entering in uh, a different consciousness, a different space, and that space is boundaried by certain elements that are part of the ceremony as practiced in my own community. Um, and so the first time I sat with the medicine and the ancient Native American church of South Dakota, I followed my sister-in-law's instructions to make a relationship with this medicine, uh, sitting in a teepee of about 30 people. Um, the road man, the, the leader of the ceremony who sat at a uh, half moon. There's so many elements that there's not really time to describe and I'm sure some of you like uh, Jeffrey have attended these ceremonies. But we open ours um, with those dekwa, those words that come before anything else. Uh, but at that time in South Dakota, uh, I followed my sister-in-law's instructions and prayed and, and until about midnight water, uh, because that's another essential element of the ceremony itself, is they'll bring water in to water the people. You're watering the people, uh, and prayers are put into that water. And uh, I was there at a going back to school ceremony. We were there to pray for our children who were going back to school. And I had just come from the University of New Mexico's Women's Health Training Program, having uh, achieved the biomedical skills necessary to be a safe practitioner. Uh, but I wanted to understand more of the traditional knowledge that went with the practice of midwifery. And so after cleansing my mind and my spirit and my body, uh, we, we, we experience this medicine will open your mind, open your body, and open your spirit. It gets your ego out of your way. And it, it uh, opens you in such a way that you have access uh, to spirit. And in that first ceremony, after cleansing my emotions and releasing uh, experiences, griefs in my life by about three in the morning after midnight water, I just felt that the prayer I had carried to, to South Dakota in that journey I was making was, Grandfather, how will I know what to do uh, in this humbleness that you show me? How will I know how to take care of two lives? How to accept that responsibility? And I don't know what I expected, but all of a sudden in my ear, I heard the words very clearly, just do it. <laughs> and this was years before the Nike commercial and the branding of the Nike cor corporation. Yeah. I. That's my <laughs> teaching, just do it. And it just uh, shifted a gear inside of me. And since that moment, you know, the oral, I, I have a uh, problem uh, 
Native American children have the highest rates of otitis media or ear infections in, in all of North America. So, something to do with uh, twisted eustachian tubes. And so I had multiple ear infections. I grew up not being able to hear. And when they finally discovered I couldn't hear, um, you know, so it's interesting that the main messages that I receive sitting around that fireplace is or what they would call an oral hallucination, but actually all your senses are involved. Your whole being is involved. And uh, the idea that it opens your mind and your body and your spirit is, is a powerful experience. And uh, in, in, I was 23 years old when I first went in as a nursing mother. And I took an infant eight months old nursing him through the ceremony. And uh, I began to realize by the time the sun rose and the woman, the water woman brought in uh, the door, the morning water, which is a representation of the feminine arriving from the spirit world into this place. I felt a lot of confidence. I understood something that is beyond words. And I'm gonna be 63 in January. That's 40 years I've been walking with this medicine and uh, using it. And so I'm the founding Aboriginal midwife of the Six Nations Birthing Center in the province of Ontario, under which we function under an exemption in the 1992 Midwifery Act and Regulated Health Professions Act for Aboriginal midwives and Aboriginal healers from any regulation by the government. And so having worked with um, the, the Interim Regulatory College of Midwives of Ontario, we has professionalized the practice of midwifery in that province. But I, before the act was proclaimed uh, by parliament, I told my colleagues, we have this exemption, a doorway of our sovereignty. If we don't use our rights, we'll lose our rights. So we were able to establish a birthing center that is still uh, delivering babies in that community and creating uh, new midwives. We have a National Aboriginal Council of Midwives in Canada, in Ontario, and you can Google www.aboriginalmidwifery.ca. And so uh, as an elder, in that process, we went from just me in Ontario to over 50 Aboriginal midwives in Canada. And we're building. <laughs> Reuben Snake and other leaders would say, everything in this teepee belongs to the women. And so that medicine has been the spirit that guides my work for all these years. And in the application of it to individual cases, uh, such as a mother who brought her daughter to me in her last week of pregnancy. She was due for her birth in four days and asked, will you deliver her baby at home? And I said, this is a process that should have begun when she first thought of getting pregnant because that's a process of asking the ancestors for a life. And four days from now, she's due, and who's been taking care of her? She said, well, we have this obstetrician, but for the last six weeks, we haven't seen him. So I said, well, let's just visit, let's just talk. And as we talked, I said, how about I just help check your belly, how have you, how have you been? What have you been doing? Why haven't you gone to your care provider? And it's this attitude, uh, very attitude of there's nothing to this. There's nothing to having a baby. Everybody has babies all the time. So I laid her down on my uh, office floor and palpated her belly. And I had already been clued in when she, I said, Hi, is your baby active? She said, no, I haven't felt my baby move in four days. So I used two different Dopplers to look for a heart rate and I couldn't find one. So I said, um, 
it might be my machine, it might be me, let's go to my sister over in the clinic and we'll find another machine to use to find the heart rate. But I could tell already there was no baby there, the, the, the flaccidity of the abdomen. But you don't want to say right away to this young mother and her mother who presented to my practice, this baby's gone. So on the way there, I talked to her mother. Mohawk women, we do everything as, as a kinship network, including handling this medicine. So I took her to the clinic, and then I explained to her mother, I said, I, I believe, out of earshot of the, the woman, I believe this baby didn't survive. But be here for your daughter, and we'll go through, but the ultimate diagnosis has to be uh, at the hospital with an ultrasound. And of course, after we went through that whole process, the baby, in fact, had passed away. Um, and so they asked me to do the delivery in the hospital, which I was happy to do. Uh, but the, the mother who, br the grandmother who brought her daughter had visited my sister before she came to my practice. And my sister told her, well, you know, Gudji uses this sacred medicine in her work. And this is a longhouse bear clan woman. And she says, are we going to see pink elephants? <laughs> and my sister assured her that she wouldn't. And so uh, as part of her care, I brought medicine with me to the hospital and ended up working with this young family and the mother. Uh, and her mother, I take them in a, the bathroom and I told them she was having a hard time getting the baby out. There's a lot to this story, so I'm just skipping through the framework of it. And I offered this medicine to the mother and to the father and then to my Bear Clan friend who had made the comment about pink elephants. I said, this is a spirit that will, is, is about birth, will open you and help you. And in using that medicine, uh, the mother, the young woman was able to relax and even take a short nap while she, her mother and I went off to take a little break. And when we came back, I got her going and she was able to um, push her baby out on her knees. And when the baby came, uh, of course, already the baby was going back to the earth. You, there's certain signs. I had prepared the young family for the signs they would see. I said, there's not going to be any muscle tone. The baby will look scalded. The skull plates will be separating. You need to be prepared for what you're going to see. And it's okay that you even hold your baby, hold your baby to your skin, talk to your baby and greet your baby and say goodbye to your baby, but we need to put the baby on the cradle board as soon as possible because these babies are literally, you know, uh, disassembling. And when the baby came out, a bubble came out of her mouth and the young father said, she's alive. I said, no, she's not alive. And handed the baby to the grandmother because the mother recoiled in her pain, uh, emotional pain. And so we put the baby on the cradle board, bathed it, the family started to show up, and we were able to take the baby back to our community and uh, take care of that, complete it, go full cycle, because part of the ceremony, part of the knowledge that belongs to it is how you move within a certain space how you carry that prayer. And it's really a beautiful attention that needs to be paid to every minute that's going on. Like a snowflake, like a fingerprint, like a dream. Every birth has its own interpretation. And this medicine is part of that interpretation. There's data beyond the, the medical chart and the lab results. And the data is made available to us through a number of indigenous practices that involves the use of these sacred medicines, always accompanied, of course, by the tobacco. And so the feedback I got in the community was, 
we got to experience a birth and not just a death. And so that is one of the clinical applications of the medicine. I've had obstetricians when I would use it for induction of labor in cases of mothers going beyond a certain gestational age for the baby. Uh, in one case, um, we brought together the whole society, set up the drum in her home and started the singing and the drumming and make her a bit of tea. She'd go into labor. And so those children who were born in this sacred way, they're really, uh, really powerful. Uh, I've had the privilege of sitting in these ceremonies and in the door comes a young man who 20 years ago was born with this medicine coming in that teepee for the first time in his life. Sit down next to me and through the night I would tell him, you know, you came into this world with this medicine and it would always reinforce something in them that is beyond uh, description. It's all in the practice. These things are all in the practice and it's Impossible to intellectualize it, though we try. And uh, uh, I just want to give you that feeling of how the practical applications of this medicine for healing and uh, the reinforcement of identity and culture, how significant it is to that process. So when we opened the birthing center at Six Nations, I had Grandma Lupe de la Cruz come to run a ceremony to open this birthing center. Uh, among several other ceremonies that were held and she went around and blessed our birthing center because she too is a midwife. And I loved how you said, Jeffrey, the interpretation of the word marakame means one who sees because that's what this medicine allows is the seeing. And uh, it's, I lost my mother when I was 11 years old. She was Mohawk from Ganawage across the river from Montreal. And my father is a Mohawk from Akwesasne. He died when I was nine months old uh, as a fighter pilot in the Korean War. And so you can imagine the burden of grief as I grew. And so at 23, when I sat there with my nursing infant, uh, I was able to see my mom and my dad and uh, introduce them to my son. So these things are really deep and significant and can change your life. And so I offer that in humbleness, uh, speaking to this question. To those of us from an Anglo-Saxon uh, descent, you know, we lack these rituals. We lack this community. We don't have the coming of age ceremonies. You know, bar mitzvah you know, is something that you have, but that's something a lot of us feel um, re religiously shipwrecked, you know? And so from my own experiences, I didn't benefit from having that cultural context and tradition to rely upon. And that's what I think why there's such an affection for First Peoples is that they've been able to preserve under great duress these rituals that are carried through time. From my point of view, because I did a lot of solo tripping, um, after my first experience, then the subsequent experience that I had, I am took a lower dose this time. <laughs> that was helpful. Uh, but it was still a five gram cubensis, you know, that's a, that's a good dose. Um, and the message that I would receive is, again, the feeling of oneness and the feeling of being, being, and realizing that all of nature is alive. Even the rocks and the dirt and everything around me was alive. And all these beings were calling out to me and saying with one voice, don't you see, wake up, we are here. We are all one together, come back. And 
the voices that I heard, they weren't auditory vo verses, uh, voices. They were just this gestalt of experiences of all this communication coming to me at once. And I was also terrified, but I felt this responsibility of now knowing that nature is, is all one and, and all these voices were calling out to me to do something to protect the biosphere, to protect the mother, that there's a continuum of ancestors and descendants of which we're one in a string. And it's so important that we you know, take the responsibility for our actions. And okay, that was a good experience. And then I'd wait a few months and I'd trip again and I got the same message. And then I'd trip again, I got the same message. And then pretty soon I realized that this was my calling and that we have a responsibility for our descendants as our ancestors had for us. And then I felt like, and my, ex, my, my mother believes in this, you know, that I was chosen and that is, it is my time now to do the maximum of what I am capable of being able to protect the planet, the biosphere, you know, and everything that that represents. So, um, this is where there's an, an emergence right now that I see within our society. The difference between being spiritual and being religious. There's an emergence of spiritual beings and consciousness that's sweeping. And we can't put it in a pigeonhole. We can't categorize it in a religious context. In fact, if you do call it a, a religion, then you're subscribing to certain doctrines and histories. And maybe it's an advantage to be religiously shipwrecked because now you're on a, your own island of consciousness and you emerge into a new spiritual realm. So you're inventing new rituals. But I see now an emergence of science and spirituality. And as I mentioned earlier, that the most modern microbiologists and scientists and the shamans of first peoples, when a person is diseased, the disease is caused by an unseen force. A microbiologist may call it a virus and a shaman may call it a spirit. But in a sense, they're unified with the same modality, but using just different terms. So what's been really refreshing to me personally with our discovery of agaricon having activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis, TB, and yet for thousands of years, uh, people's used agaricon to fight consumption. Well, we authenticated scientifically that which was known for thousands of years. So this is where modern me medicine really needs to go to full circle to systems treatment, not looking for magic bullets and the magic molecule, because when we isolate constituents away from the whole, they can be extremely powerful, but they lose the advantage of synergism and evolution. Um, so from my experiences, and this has been my creative you know, well that I've drank from, has been provided to me from my psychedelic experiences and having an open heart and an open mind. And I really am, I'm not a very smart person. <laughs> I really, I am not a very smart person. I didn't score very well on my SATs. My, <laughs> I would always like score and then I'd erase the right answer and then I'd mark the other one, you know? But, and um, so, you know, I might have these innovations and ideas, but I just really don't feel ownership of them. I just can't faithfully and honestly tell you that I really come up with these ideas. They've been gifted to me. They've been given to me. And if I have found the missing link between bees and nature, is mycelium, and bees have gone to rotted logs for millions of years because of immunological benefit. And I'm the first one to see this when we all grew up with Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> and this was facing us right in our face. What does that say about our spiritual understanding of nature? And this is why I think First Peoples in particular, Native Americans of the North Americas have really 
uh, given us some wonderful baselines to reflect upon. The concept of seven generations speaks so eloquently and purposely about what we need to take responsibility for, which is antithetical to the millisecond short trading by computers on Wall Street. It is something that we need to have a new ecological metric that measures the value of spiritualism, clean water, biodiversity, way of life, and we need to have a shakedown of our economic system. And I think these sacraments lead us to a new paradigm shift in consciousness. And um, so even though Ram Das or Terence McKenna said, when you get the message, hang up the phone, I think you need to pick up the phone a lot more often. <laughs> I have a um, close to 30-year-old son who also follows the same spiritual path as me. He came into the teepee with me in, in, uh, when he was about um, eight and then traveled with me to Brazil, and, and it's been part of my life. And, and one of the things that really inspired me being in Brazil and also within the Native, Native American church is the multi-generational you know, reality of... of grandparents there with their children, with their grandchildren, and, and participating in the rituals together, and, and the, the meaningful dimension of you know, true family values and how that gets passed along within the, within the ceremonies. And I mention this because my, uh, my son went through a process a number of years back of applying to college. And he, among the different universities that he was uh, looking into, one was Princeton University, and they had a, a really interesting application. And on the application it said, uh, the, the person that you're going to spend the most time with over the course of your life is yourself. And so you should strive to make yourself the most interesting person possible. And I thought that was a really good way to approach, you know, your education. And, and I mention that because a lot of the times the information and the guidance and the instructions that's come to me through the plants has come to me through my own thoughts. But there's a quality that's different. I know my own thoughts really well. I spend a lot of time hanging out with myself and thinking about things. And when a thought comes in that's really not mine, you know, as Paul was describing, it's kind of like a gift of something that comes to you, um, you feel it. It has a different, it, it's got, it's much more organized than my thoughts. It's much more connected to the past, present, and future than my thoughts. It has a, a resonant quality of, of, like it's very rare that if I have a thought on my own, I'll go, wow. <laughs> but, when, but when a thought comes, like from a spiritually inspired thought, I'll even sit there and admire, you know, my own, this thought appeared inside of my own head. So it's, I, and I think that, that I, it's acknowledged that plants have intelligence. I think we all realize that. And if we consider the possibility that there's such a thing as sacred plants that are connected to a superior intelligence, and that when we receive communion or we ingest or we, you know, I mean, the Native American church, they speak of the peyote as the flesh of God. You know, that that's what you're digesting. It's it, it, the sense of, of communion, of, of like a sacrament. And, and within the Catholic Church, it's, it's you know, the, 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 there's this process they describe of transmutation, which something becomes something holy. Within these traditional practices, the holiness is inherent. It doesn't have to go through a process to be holy. It's holiness is inherent. And so you take it in yourself. And as I was explaining earlier today, it makes you whole. And I've had some visions of things that would come to pass. I've had some things that were told to me, this will happen in your life. And I didn't say anything about it to anybody. I figured a healthy dose of cynicism or skepticism about your own proclivity to self-delusion or self-misdirection you know, um, misdirection is really a healthy thing to approach you know, this, this path with. But I feel that along the way I would hold it and watch, and then these things would come to pass. And so I think over time you learn to discern what, are the, what is the guidance, what is the teaching, what is the inspiration that comes to you from the spirit realm, which is um, you can really rely on, and what are just the machinations maybe of your own thought process that don't have the same direction, don't have the same quality. Um, so I thought one thing that might be interesting to unpack a little bit since we're at Bioneers and um, we're thinking about the earth and eco-consciousness is um, some of these um, plant 
plants seem to have the capacity to really, as Paul described, trigger this connection, you know, even among urban people who spend very little time in the un, you know, unmolested natural world. Um, and um, some people are, you know, are speculating, for instance, that ayahuasca is expanding from its boundaries in the Amazon as though it were had a conscious intent to try to infuse eco-consciousness to people who need it throughout the world so that we'll get to um, a higher consciousness so that we'll be able to deal with the, the problems we're facing. How do you all feel about that? Um, what do you think it is that triggers this type of eco-consciousness? It doesn't happen to everyone, but, um, and do you think um, that that is something that can be harnessed and that can grow into a larger movement and what role these plants might play in that? In terms of the Pejuta Wakan, the peyote, uh, there was a, already a movement in the 60s of the unity caravans across North America and into Central and South America. And it's from those connections across the hemisphere that this medicine moved through the communities. And in my community of Akwesasne, those of us who uh, hold the responsibility for this medicine know that in our oral history, this medicine came to our community about 100 years ago. But these beings, these spirit beings, if the people are not ready, because this medicine is not for everybody, uh, the medicine will leave. And when you know, we, we heard uh, at the beginning, in the opening of Bioneers, uh, beautiful uh, presentations by Kenny and Nina, um, focusing on the power of the social intelligence. And so while we're talking about our own personal individual experiences with these sacred medicines, the fact is, is that the power of the connected knowers who participate in the ceremonial context, it takes a lot to put up a ceremony. From the men who go out in the woods to gather the, the logs for the fire in just a certain way, the way they have to carry their mind for the purpose of the meeting. Maybe you have a life in your hands. Someone is really sick. They have a terminal illness. And you have to keep your prayer focused on your intentions for that human being. And so from the gathering of the firewood and how it's cut, it has to be wood that's never touched the ground. It's not just laying on the ground. It has to be brought down, dried a certain way, split a certain way, stacked a certain way. The women, the, the, the water woman who brings the water in the morning, uh, prepares the food for the, for the noon meal uh, that's part of the culmina culmination of the ceremony, and it has to be made in a specific way with prayer. The utmost attention is paid to every movement, and if you act in a certain way, it's noticed right away. And the, such beauty comes out of that social landscape that every ceremony you sit in, when your intention is to help someone else make it through a really rough time in their life, Maybe it's a six-year-old child who was brought in there, suffered sexual abuse, and by morning that little one is holding the staff and the instruments, having made his own song. These are really powerful pieces. So this question of the expansion of consciousness through the movement of these medicines, through human experience, has always been at play, has always been at work and will continue in spite of any one of us. And so uh, we think of it that way. We hold it in utmost respect because we know that this grandfather medicine, he knows uh, everything about us, uh, even beyond words, what's in our hearts. And, and uh, if you don't hold this medicine in a certain way, it will leave you, it will leave your people. So we have rejected the title of uh, Native American Church because of our history of colonization. And in our longhouse, we have a number of medicine societies, the different historic societies that you can read about in Fenton and other anthropologists that still survive. And all of us who sit in that teepee society 
belong to some of these other medicine societies as well, and we bring all of that uh, knowledge to the holding of, of this sacred uh, power. And so uh, it just happens. Uh, one thing we haven't discussed in terms of the perception and the acuity of this experience of engaging this medicine is the medicine of time itself because you become acutely aware of time. And as a midwife, time is everything in a course of care. There's military time, obstetrical time, physiological time, but there's also sacred time. And so I wanted to mention that today in the, in the ways of the days of the Mayan calendar is seven keme, the day of the ancestors. And we've spoken, each one of us, about the ancestors and so, even that is brought into the ceremonial space. In my own work over the last 40 some years, my theory is the connection between birth, dream, and ceremony, that all three to have meaning and interpretation have to be connected. And I know these things because in the practice of using this medicine to give birth to my own children and using this medicine as an Aboriginal midwife, uh, it moves through uh, the people as needs arise. And it isn't just an individual experience. You are a group of connected knowers. And so out of that fireplace, it's like those spirits are in there and they'll even throw a coal at you, like an exclamation point. Wake up and, and look at, you have to pay attention you're in class, you're sitting in a university course in there in one night. And the knowledge that comes out of that is, is the purposes for healing. And uh, the last thing I wanna say is that in that first meeting I went in, I had the overwhelming feeling of the creator's love and what a gift that was. I always thought I know what love is but there was a moment where I experienced love that was beyond the ego. Uh, what I want out of love, I want him to be this way, or I want, you know, all of that was removed. And the prayer becomes, when you truly love, you want the best for that other human being who was put into this earth for a purpose. Each one of you was born into a medicine of time, personality of a particular day. And there's a reason you're in this world and you can tell from what my colleagues on this panel have described of their own life's experience that this, these spirits will come after you. And you can say no, but you better watch out. <laughs> From this moment, I'm starting to trip. You know, this, uh, uh, I feel this this concept of super love and super consciousness, and when under the the influence of these, you know, the the doors of perception, many people use different phrases, but I've always sensed that oh, this is what it's all about. This is the super reality of which we only have a limited glimpse of, and when we come down, we're living in a limited reality right now. But under the, the influence of these sacraments, the whole world view, the universal view of consciousness, you know, becomes quite apparent. And you realize you're not seeing everything that's out there because you're, 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 you're filtered because of survival and, and other factors we don't even know about. But here's an interesting little factoid because I like facts. Um, 22 primates eat mushrooms. And we being primates, we're number 23. Ascopoliparus is consumed by the Golgi a monkey, a small primate in the Amazon basin. And if I have my, my memory correct, um, he, he eats, um, the monkeys eat nearly their body weight in mushrooms every two months. So it is their major source of protein. And you can look this up, Ascopoliparus Golgi, G-O-E-L-D-I. Um, so our primates have had a history and there are brothers and sisters, 
And so the stoned ape theory by Roland Fisher from 1962, repopularized by Terence McKenna, and Terence was a dear brother, and I feel like Terence is with us here right now, just uh, supporting us in, in this conversation. Um, but this, you know, and I can say this to Terence, to you right now, Terence, some of your ideas were bullshit. <laughs> but I think, and many people have said this also, if 10% of Terence's ideas are true, they are so profound that it washes away everything else that he, we may not says, you know, think that's possible. But Terence has con uh, repopularized the concept of the stoned ape theory, which basically states that as when we were forest primates and the savannas increased, then most primates eat grub, eat insect larvae, and as you track ungulates, you know, animals, and if you're tracking an animal, you look for footprints and you look for scat. And in the subtropics, the most predominant mushroom growing in manure, when you're tracking the ungulates across the prairie, is Slosophy cubensis. So you're tracking these animals, you're trying to hunt, you find scat, this big fleshy mushroom, very predominant, comes out of the scat, the manure. You and your family and your clan consume this because you're hungry, and then you're catapulted into this amazing sensory inputting that's just far beyond anything that you had experienced before. And the theory is that it caused a split in the evolution of humans and led to present day consciousness. I think that's a very, very credible theory. I really do. I think all the logic is in place that you would have these encounters and those of us who have these encounters know. By the way, this is a safe question for the audience. How many people here have not tripped on sacramental plants and mushrooms? Not, okay. No matter what you've read, no matter what you've seen, you really have no idea. <laughs> Fair enough, everybody else, right? Fair enough. Um, so this is where I'm wondering, um, and you mentioned time, and we don't have time right now to go through different experiences, but you know, time is bent and through these experiences, and you, know, you can see into the future, um, and this now is perhaps scientifically validated by the concept of the multiverse, that these, these sacraments allow you to change uh, the present framework that's occurring simultaneously all things happen all the time, all possibilities, all at once. And you can shape shift from one dimension into the other and then, come re and then return. So this, I think, is perhaps the beginning of scientific support of the vision quest of seeing into the future and bending time with allowing us to have a portal into the multiverse and then it returns to it. Um, just a thought. <laughs> yeah. So what I remember the question to be related to ecological consciousness perhaps being stimulated by the use of these plants. And, and um, I just came back from uh, Ibiza, Spain, where there was the first international conference on ayahuasca that was held there. I was asked to, to speak about the issue of human rights and, and, uh, and legal issues related to the use of these sacred plants, which were held as a guarded secret for centuries within the Amazon, and then today have, uh, there were people from 60 different countries that were there, um, who, all of whom had had some experience either traveling to Peru or, or people that were bringing different ways of working with these plants into their communities, and it was really, uh, um, I started to think a lot about it. And I think it's, it's interesting in terms of anybody who's been to the Amazon forest, there's a, um, you can't help but be ecologically awakened entering into it because of the, 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 the profound expression of life that's there. Um, Jacques Cousteau even established a center in the, in the city of Manaus, which is on the Amazon River. Uh, this is a person who spent his life studying the oceans, and he was so moved going into the Amazon that he set up an ecological center to bring people into the Amazon forest. 
And so I, I think that um, a lot of these instruments depend very much on who's utilizing them and, the, and, and what the objective is in, in, in utilizing. You know, the, the particular sacrament that we work with has to be prepared. It's, it's, there are two plants that are involved and there's a ritual through which they're prepared. And the intention of, of how they're prepared and the way that they're prepared and what happens in the ceremony as they're being prepared affects very much the result of what happens after people, you know, receive it. Um, clearly, I believe that there's the potential within all of these to, as I said earlier today, to connect us to the mind of nature and to start to understand things from the perspective of, of the, the universal consciousness, the universal mind. And I feel that that's why it's important to be talking about this because we need an upgrade to our operating system. And, and I have no, I, I've no, not seen a better way than through these divine instruments. I think we'll just keep the conversation going because we have eight minutes instead of opening it to question two. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, by the way, um, you know, we only have about, uh, this has been so interesting and involving about six minutes left, so I think we're just going to keep the conversation going and this will be, um, sorry about that, but, um, you know, okay. <laughs> Sustainability of what? Oh, peyote. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so, all right. We'll do make one exception. But um, I know, Gudji, you've spoken about this before. That that um, peyote is an, almost an endangered species, and um, that. And I, I think I'll, I'll open it up for a final, larger question, which is, um, I heard you say these medicines are not for everyone, and I think that we so also have a social responsibility, in a sense, to express what are set and setting is important, but also perhaps who shouldn't be doing this or under what conditions shouldn't they be doing it because these are powerful tools. So both the question of the endangered species itself and who should or shouldn't be doing it and then also um, what a context would be that would protect people who shouldn't be doing this from, from doing it. That's a complicated question and I don't think six minutes can do it any justice. But thank you for the thought. And it's true that those who make the pilgrimage to the peyote gardens, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a challenge and it's a big concern because the landowners where the medicine grows uh, have to, out of the kindness of their own compassion, make it available. And, uh, you know, it's on our minds. Uh, the Lakota will say, oh, the Navajo, they're eating all the medicine. <laughs> so there's that natural, you know. But it's like anything in creation. Um, you have to, I really believe that if we don't use our medicines, we'll lose our medicines. As uh, Robin Kimmerer said, they'll turn their faces away from us because they are spirits. And so uh, that's the best I know how to answer. I, I don't know the bigger picture of, you know, I work in environmental health, uh, and so I, I have a great appreciation for what you're saying, but I really don't have the answer. Well, I wanna just, I'll do this as quickly as I can. Dr. Alexander Smith was the father of American mycology, the most famous mycologist in North America, if not the world. Very conservative man. I got to know him. He published a monograph on the genus Psilocybe. And at the end of it, toward when he was about 75 years of age, he asked me, Paul, I want a trip on Psilocybes with you. I've never done them. I've written about them. I've published, you know, 30 or 40 new species. I've read about it, but I want to do it. And he asked me, and I was in, in Snowmass, Colorado. I thought about it the next day, went back to him, and I said, Alex, I will trip with mushrooms with you only if your wife Helen joins us. I said, Helen, will you join us? And she goes, no. And then I said, Alex, I don't want you to have this experience and create a division in your marriage because the, your worldview could change so radically at the end of your life. Towards the end of your life, it's going to be, it's not responsible for me. Now, so I turned him down. My own father asked me near the end of his life to trip with me. And I said, no, for the same reason. But another individual, Bill Webb of Big Sur, California, he, he became a father figure to me. We did trip together. And the, the sort of the Bill, Bill gave me a message before he died. He was losing his hearing, his senses. 
He was, uh, had a, 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 a philosophy convensus trip on Big Sur. And he said, Paul, I have to tell you this. It's important you tell everybody about this experience. And I go, what is it, Bill? He says, well, I was, I was tripping on Cubensis. I had five grams. And I was uh, on the deck, you know, above the ocean, a beautiful place, a big sur. And I heard this noise. Click, 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 click. And it like, is mystifying to me. Now, he's wearing a hearing aid. And he goes, the worst thing about aging is you're losing your senses. You know, I can't hear the ocean without my hearing aid. He took his hearing aid out when he was tripping. And he heard this click, 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 click. And he's there, and, the, and, he could, and he's wondering what the heck this was. And it took him about 15 or 20 minutes. And he heard ants walking on the boards going past him. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My own current study of this, and, and I think it's an ongoing consideration is it really depends on the strength of the community within which people are receiving this opportunity. That, that I've been in communities of, of uh, within the practice we have, I've been in rituals where there have been, you know, five, 600 people, you know, involved in, in, in a ceremonial journey together. I was actually in a Native American church ceremony on the night that Reuben Snake was, um, his memorial service where there were a thousand people eating peyote in a, in a you know, in a, in a gymnasium together. Um, and so, but the, the, the strength of the community was what was really the factor that allowed all kinds of people to come in and find healing. And so I think that the, the most important factor is the strength of the communities that develop around this use that would allow us to be able to receive different kinds of people. There are people, for example, that come to us who I wish we could be able to receive, but we're not yet mature enough, you know, or in the past haven't been as mature in a community. There was a, a young man in, in Hawaii who was addicted to um, uh, methamphetamines, and, and he was seeking a community within which he could come and, and, uh, and work with sacred medicines. And, and we didn't feel that we were able to where I live, but I checked with a community which has a much longer ex uh, existence than we do in Brazil, and they would have been happy you know, to receive him and, and felt that they could easily work with something like that. So I think it depends on the, the systems of community and, and the structures of family that are in place to, to receive people. Okay, thank you so much. I wish we had more time. This has been an incredible discussion, but thank you so much to our three presenters.